I'm at Penn State University in downtown Metropolitan State College, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, I am a third year student here at Penn State where I am in the management and organizations department of our business school. Um, I, I largely study macro phenomena um, and uh, right now I'm kind of neck deep in looking at the genomics industry. So, so really excited to kind of have this conversation. I, 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 participated last time for the first time and it was uh, it just spurred a lot of questions for me thinking about how do I um, how do I incorporate these conversations that we're having into my everyday work so I can start trying to change some of the paradigms uh, of how do we how do we publish and how do we research and how do we write papers so Glad to be here. Thanks, Celeste. Great. And yeah, and we're just quickly introducing ourselves uh, before we get going. Um, it is jumping around, but I'll try to keep track. Uh, Alex, can you say hello? And if not. Okay. Hi. Um, oh, I'm, go I'm Alex Lewis. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, UT San Antonio. Uh, Celeste invited me to uh, participate in here because uh, I'm an institutional theorist and uh, my dissertation is focused on legitimacy. Uh, in addition, I was uh, raised Quaker. And so though I don't research humanistic management, I have uh, very strong humanistic leanings. Cool. Welcome. All right. Um, Alma, can you... Um... Are you in a place where you can talk? And maybe you can see yourself coming up in my list and anticipate. Uh, so if Alma is maybe not able to do that, uh, can we go to Jenny? Ah, uh, okay. Thanks, Jenny. She's, she's at 4 a.m. Wow, that is commitment. Um, how about June Mai? Anyone going on down? Michael, Pyle, Samir. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Pyle, can you hear me? Yes, hi, welcome. Okay. I'm Pyle from Delhi. Um, I'm a professor working at a startup university and chair HROB, but I was in the corporate sector for many years and I convocated uh, for my PhD a couple of years ago. But I'm finding that in the university, I'm getting more and more dragged into um, administrative work. So I think it's really important to keep touch with the uh, theory and, you know, uh, seem to have a humanistic bent. And um, so I thought I'd really like to listen to this to keep wow. me grounded in research. Yeah? Okay. You're welcome. Um, and I think Stu is um, potentially also at a late night. Um, Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Situation. Oh, yeah, we can. Hi. Great. Yes, um, yes, I'm from Hong Kong, so it's midnight here. Um, I'm a, um, a faculty member at um, uh, an university in Hong Kong. My area of research is in leadership and identity, basically. And um, that's where I worked in Durham, UK before and came back to Hong Kong. But at the moment, I'm writing a paper on um, tackling grand challenges, um, specifically property alleviation, linking it to um, leadership. So, and also I'm, in, I'm interested in institutional theories because um, a lot of my um, research is about um, looking at um, the social enterprise context and studying leadership in that context there. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. Super, thanks Sue. All right, I think we've heard from everybody by chat or audio, except for <clears throat> maybe Samir. Uh, Samir, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, hey, where are yeah. you calling in from? Yes, I'm Samir, I'm from uh, Denmark. I actually joined this, um, I realized it's about institutional theory and uh, legitimacy uh, most uh, dominantly. So I haven't worked on legitimacy for some years. I've tried to escape it. My PhD focus and my current work as assistant professor in 
Roskill University is about business strategy and corporate social responsibility strategies in developing countries. Uh, I always found the uh, discussion about legitimacy annoying, uh, but uh, now I have a <laughs> handbook about uh, about this topic and the political CSR uh, discussion. So I thought that might uh, catch up here. And Great. So, uh, I hope it's useful. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that's great. I think we've, uh, we probably should just get going. I'm sure people will be coming and going as Victoria mentioned and, and others as we go, but let's get started. So we're covering two articles today. Um, one of the things I thought I would mention before we um, dive into it is this is humanistic management reading group. So we should talk about the people. Um, Mark is now at, um, it's hard with all these windows. Uh, he's now at Brown. He was at um, <clears throat> Madison, uh, Wisconsin, when he wrote this article. Uh, it's his most ci highly cited article, and it, um, I imagine he didn't look like this in 1995, but um, so that we can kind of have a feel for for who he he is and what he's about as we as we go into this. And I know that um, many of us have 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 read, and, and maybe not all of us. So we'll kind of take this in a couple of uh, pieces. I want to uh, cover each article separately. Celeste is going to lead us through the second article and then save the bulk of our time for, you know, how do we as, as wanting to pursue humanistic management approach topics uh, like legitimacy and institutions. Therefore, let's dive in. Um, right at the beginning, and I'll kind of try to get these all out of your way. Um, I do want to watch in case people bring up good comments. Uh, I'll respond to those over here. But um, right away, Sushman is talking about uh, things like institutions and things like uh, legitimacy and saying these are concerns uh, going back all the way. So um, I know we've got um, some of that in the intro, but if you go to your uh, participant um, tab, you'll see this little button called raise hand. Um, so I know I've talked about institutions in my uh, research or my coursework, uh, had uh, two classes on it, I think, maybe three. <laughs> um, how many else have come across institutions before uh, in some form in, in, your, in your work? You know what they are, that kind of thing. Raise your hand if, you, if you're familiar with institutions. Great, Celeste, that would be good since you're <laughs> The one who suggested this? Yeah, all right. Um, so for everyone else, you know, a lot of this comes down to uh, ideas about the social construction of reality. How do um, people coming together make meaning out of, out of what they're doing? And people observed over time that they tend to repeat that you tend to build these kinds of social structures like the nation state, like companies, like law um, that then become entities on their own. And then the question becomes, why do they exist? And the answer to that is they have legitimacy. So Sushman comes along and he's wanting to summarize all of these questions about why companies in particular can have legitimacy. And on this first page that I've got showing up, he brings up all the big questions like, um, are companies bounded um, identifiable entities or are they open systems that are flowing into other companies and the market and their customers and their environment? And if they're that, then um, you know, how, do we, how do we draw conclusions about those kinds of things? Let me see if I can pull up. I've got your clean version here, my version is um, much more highlighted. <laughs> um, but he comes down to this, this final um, summary at the beginning that he's going to look at how people constrain, construct, and empower organizational actors. And I'll stop there just to see if anybody wants to jump in uh, with a question about the underlying um, theory or uh, an observation about kind of that, the way Sushman sets up his um, argument. 
Any thoughts? We can all take our hands down. We'll maybe use those again later. Great. Oh, and Victoria took off. That's fine. Sure. Um, I think one of the keys that I, I want to jump to is, is here on the second, um, the second page, kind of at the end. Um, Sushman's basic contribution here, he puts it in his third part, but he talks about it in the introduction, is this sentence I'm going to highlight here. Um, he builds three different kinds of legitimacy, pragmatic, moral, and cognitive. And I think this was surprising to me. Um, I wasn't necessarily sure when I thought of the word legitimacy that I thought it had three dimensions. Um, I definitely thought it had a moral dimension, right? Who else, uh, I guess we'll go back to hands, who else understands legitimacy as kind of a moral thing? This is what we should do. And anybody wanna add why having a, cog a cognitive or pragmatic dimension is interesting and different to a moral dimension of leg legitimacy. Yeah. What about you, Celeste? Oh, who else was jumping in there? Uh, I was. Okay, I don't know. So, oh, that's uh, Alex. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alex, my uh, dissertation's on legitimacy. Uh, so, um, the Suchman typology uh, in relation to cognitive, pragmatic, and moral legitimacy has been further refined, particularly in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. that I think will make more uh, understandable why you have these different dimensions. Yeah, tell me about that. Um, so cognitive legitimacy has sort of been separated as a type of legitimacy from moral and pragmatic. Um, when something is cognitively legitimate, as Suchman defines it, it is comprehensible and taken for granted. It's essentially become a social fact of reality. And as such, we don't evaluate it. We don't think about it. It just is. Uh, so when you go into a P.F. Chang's and there is a, a host who seats you and a waitress who takes your order, you don't think about the existence of those roles. They're cognitively, legit cognitively legitimate. That's part of how we define and understand a restaurant. Mm -hmm. However, if something is not cognitively legitimate, we then actively evaluate its appropriateness for its social context. And when we actively evaluate its appropriateness, we do so along a pragmatic dimension or a moral dimension. We ask ourselves, um, you know, does this make sense instrumentally? We ask ourselves, and, and, and if it does, we say that it's pragmatically legitimate or instrumentally legitimate. Um, does it make sense morally? Does it align with my values or overarching social values? Uh, if it does, we, we say it's morally legitimate. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Alex. And uh, very insightful. I think, think that gets to the heart of what's so interesting about the cognitive dimension, because actually that's the moment when you kind of stop using cognition. It's taken for granted in Suchman's terminology, right? Or comprehensible. So the idea that something's legitimate just because it slides easily on through our imagination um, is becomes kind of a real ground for, uh, in his case, what companies are aiming for. They want to just be assumed, uh, or not even assumed, they want to be um, pre-rationally accepted, right? Um, good, thank you. Any thoughts on the pragmatic legitimacy? This has a lot more to do with power, right? Let me jump to his typology that Alex just mentioned, because I think it's us into some of this. Now, this is really <laughs> a two by two matrix, right? Um, the two interesting dimensions, or two by three matrix. The interesting dimensions are here, Sushman's pragmatic, moral, and cognitive. And then he's also asking us, um, is this something that is a one time, that's episodic, or something that we do ongoing. I think he didn't feel like he was gonna get published on that, and so he added yet another dimension, and we get 12, but he mostly uses them in that kind of um, six uh, or four sets of categories. Now, I'm gonna let Celeste take over in just a moment, but my main question that I raise when I think about uh, legitimacy, especially um, not just whether companies 
because uh, that's what organizations, that's what Sushman is looking at, have these kinds of legitimacy, but then he goes into this extended discussion of how they can get it. They can tell people's stories. They can uh, reorganize and tell everyone that they're not going to do that bad thing anymore. They can um, put out PR and advertising talking about how, how great they are and all the good things they do for society. But my question as a humanistic um, scholar is, A, is it most important that companies have legitimacy or do we want to think about legitimacy for other kinds of things like people or society? And secondly, um, should we be looking at it in terms of something that companies seek to get or is it more normative? Is it more about society awarding legitimacy and for what purposes? So with that as a prompt, um, let's just see for a few seconds, uh, did anybody hearing about kind of companies you might think about, uh, well, British Petroleum donating lots of money to cleaning up the environment or trying to recover its image after some kind of scandal. And we have numbers of these at this point. Is the company getting legitimacy the best or, or a, a helpful way for humanistic scholars to, um, to theorize and to, to research? That's my main prompt. Any thoughts? And, actually, and Alex, you may have a you may have a, a take on this if your dissertation is on it. But yeah, Celeste, go for it. I, and I'm sorry, just to clarify your last question, you, you were asking companies receiving legitimacy or being endowed with legitimacy because why? I, I think I missed the first part of your question. So my question is, is that the right construct for this question? So is it companies that seek legitimacy or is it uh, society that determines what legitimacy is, is are humanistic scholars interested not so much in whether this organization has it or doesn't have it, but in how society as a whole or how people individually make these kinds of evaluations. Right, so this is a very instrumental, we're gonna help some manager increase his share price approach, right? I'm asking, is that appropriate? Okay, so I just, I think I just typed up your question up in the chat box um, so that everyone could, could see that. Well, well summarized, thanks. Did I capture that correctly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I can um, answer those questions from a legitimacy perspective. Perspective. This is Alex again uh, from a leg legitimacy perspective, but um, I don't want to dominate the conversation. So if anybody else has something to say about it, you know, uh, let them. Yeah, go for it. And we'll, um, people can think about it as well. And we may come back to it at the end. Uh, okay, so to answer uh, each question, um, Yes, you know, companies seek legitimacy um, for various reasons and at various stages. Uh, companies that are in sort of the nascent stages um, are particularly eager to, to, to attain cognitive legitimacy, to take that taken for grantedness because they're so, um, under scru they're, they're so scrutinized. But I think you were talking more about, with your British Petroleum example, established companies, companies that we don't, you know, that, that we give the benefit of the doubt in terms of their existence. Um, when they do things that sort of trigger a mental alarm and makes us go back and look and say, okay, is this company appropriate for its social context? Is, is that the kind of company you're talking about when you, when you ask about uh, seeking legitimacy? Sure. I mean, definitely um, in the dimension of repairing legitimacy, I think that Sushman has established companies in mind, right? Somebody has right. lost them in order to repair it. So there's a good paper, I think, addressing both uh, the first and the second question. Uh, Lamin and Zahir, either 2011, 2012, it's an org science. Um, Wall Street versus Main Street, something, something, that basically looks at the, uh, takes a legitimacy perspective to the scandal around, uh, I believe, sweatshops, the use of sweatshops by um, uh, Nike and, and other sportswear manufacturers, and finds, first of all, that uh, whether or not a company loses or gains legitimacy depends on um, the the audience, right? So that this these activities did not cost Nike any legitimacy in the eyes of Wall Street, 
but it, it did cost some legitimacy in the eyes of Main Street. Mm. And it also further explores the different strategies by which, and some more successful than others, uh, they proceeded to try and regain the um, regain that legitimacy. And though they don't necessarily talk about it in specific moral, cognitive, or, 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 or pragmatic terms, I think the focus of that article was on regaining moral legitimacy. Mm. Great. Um, I didn't catch the name, Alex, so if you might... Oh, I can put it in the it, text. Lemon. So here... Samir, I think, is also wanting to jump in. So while you type... Um, can you come off mute, Samir? Clear. Perfect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, relating to the question, I think uh, one of the things that I rediscovered in this, reading this paper again was that it's very rational, uh, relative understanding. Right? So uh, you can have, you know, the approach of legitimacy can be a, 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 a tripart kind of, you can have both in your action as a company, a pragmatic or moral or, and uh, somehow uh, cognitive. So. But what I kind of always miss in this discussion is there seems to be a very, even though they talk about open systems, et cetera, but there seems to be a very um, biased understanding of who the public is and who, what, is, what is a cognitive understanding. So one of the things that I work with is what is legitimacy for multinational companies in Afghanistan as a conflict area. And one of my findings is that uh, the companies need to cooperate with the insurgent groups like the Taliban. At the same time, they have to work with the NATO and the U.S. Uh, armies and the Afghan state. So there you definitely have different cognitive understanding of uh, what legitimacy is. And my question is always, well, isn't, isn't a company's legitimacy always a kind of a, more a discussion of trade-off? And then uh, a discussion about which tactic to use, which kind of legitimacy type to use. So we, I kind of miss the, the, the core discussion before that. So when do you actually, so some of these companies do engage with the Taliban in order to operate, but they of course don't state this in, in their CSR policies. Uh, but what they do state is that they do community development, which in my view, is very much related to the demands of the Taliban to build a mosque. Why the hell would they build a mosque if, if not anybody asked them to do so? So, so where, where does the trade-off go here? So it's very easy to make them a very legitimate company. At the same time, if you ask the Taliban one second, if they don't um, live up to these conditions, they will shut uh, down some of their points. I mean, uh, assets, etc. cetera. So, um, my question is really, uh, is legitimacy seen from an open system once you take it from a company perspective? But what if, what if the cognitive is multiple? What if there are multiple cognitive understanding of what is legitimacy at one place, at one space? What happens? How do companies then take point of departure in the cognitive and then try to respond? So, um... I, I can quickly, I guess, point you in the direction of where institutional theory has gone in answering that question. Um, so what you're describing is this type of institutional complexity. Um, when you have different uh, actors who have their own institutional logics, and within these logics, they have their own definitions for what is legitimate, both in terms of, you know, what constitutes an organization of this form, cognitive legitimacy, um, you know, what are the appropriate values to align to moral legitimacy and, you know, what are the appropriate goals to work towards instrumental legitimacy. And so you have a very uh, well-developed literature over the last 10 years uh, looking at uh, this institutional complexity and how uh, one goes about balancing the different demands to try to reach sort of a, a bare minimum of legitimacy with all stakeholders so that they can avoid sanction or punishment. Yeah, um, I think Sue has a point. Uh, it definitely wrote a great comment. Sue, do you want to explain that a little bit over audio? Hello, I um, sorry, I, I, I read um, the article basically ages ago. So 
um, I haven't done any research on it, so I'm really trying to um, get myself up to speed. But um, Tyson talked about um, repairing legitimacy, but then I have a question um, because um, I, I've heard about repairing trust because trust could be damaged because it possibly could be shared between two parties or two organizations or uh, an individual or stakeholder in an organization. However, I have a question, can legitimacy be shared like that? Because it's a kind of perceived um, reality, right? Um, because trust is very much like a currency that is owned and shared by two parties. But legitimacy doesn't need to be, I, from my point of view, it's just a perceived reality. It doesn't need to be shared. I just want to clarify that. And I would, I, if I have to engage in the discussing legitimacy, um, a company can, can, can claim legitimacy, but it doesn't need, uh, can, it might not be granted. It, it can claim, but it, uh, um, the, the stakeholder may not grant um, the company um, their legitimacy. So I don't know. I would appreciate if somebody could help me clarify that. Those are some great points. Um, I know Alex will have great answers. Um, but to try to keep the discussion as open as possible, anybody else want to try to um, speak to Sue's really good point? Is trust the same thing as legitimacy? Um, I know, uh, and I'm not trying to shut you down, Alex. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here because I'm learning so much. Um, I think my first um, take from this article would be, um, Sue, that that A, um, Sushman talks about legitimacy as the kind of thing that can be resilient. So it doesn't immediately break or breach. Um, it kind of endures for a while. And secondly, I think institutionalism as a whole steps away from the idea of trust, which kind of has a, you tell the truth. You and I keep on one another um, to legitimacy because sometimes, uh-oh, uh sometimes, you can be in a situation where what's legitimate isn't actually the same thing as being trustworthy. And an example would be a company I used to work for will lay people off without warning. And that's not trustworthy, but that was believed by the company, by many in the industry to be a legitimate practice and accepted. And um, although even the employees didn't like it, they sort of got along with it. So it, it had a certain kind of legitimacy to it, even though it was untrustworthy behavior. So I would separate those two things. But um, anyone want to add anything? And Alex, feel free to jump in. And if not, um, probably a good time to hand over to Celeste. We're about halfway through. Sure. Uh, and I actually, Celeste I just, wanted to, call out, um, I just yeah. wanted to call out Michael's comment in the chat box where, where he notes kind of the, the typical definition. Um, because usually, uh, Trust is not something that I have studied a great deal about, but <laughs> this was the one thing that I could remember about trust, which was, um, you know, the the forms of the forms are the bases of trust and benevolence, comp competence, and integrity. So I wanted to call out Michael's uh, comment there. Um, so I would say that uh, that these are these are related. Uh, obviously, um, you're it is you're. If someone, if you feel that someone has a form of legitimacy, uh, you know, in terms of, of the, uh, uh, I'm losing my, my, uh, if someone, if, uh, if, if you have pragmatic legitimacy, for example, um, uh, you know, if someone believes that you are competent and are capable of uh, doing the job, then it is likely that that they will trust you on the basis of competence. For example, um, so so these are linked ideas, but not necessarily the same. Yeah, if I can just add, Tyson, I think that your company example is trust is also multifaceted, and that uh, layoff, even though morally maybe repugnant to the employees, 
is maybe a play towards competence for investors. So there are multiple stakeholder uh, trust uh, bases that you might uh, use to, to explain behavior. And I think that there is much more of a overlap between the trust literature and the legitimacy one, even though trust typically comes from the individual uh, relational level. All right, well, we'll come back to try and discuss both articles uh, together at the end. Um, and I think Celeste is prepared to lead us through, you know, kind of what a Charlene, and Zeitz, uh, Charlene Zeitzma and Tom Lawrence have to say in a much more up-to-date uh, perspective on this issue. Uh, and you're muted, uh, Celeste, we can't hear you. <laughs> it's always good to take yourself off mute. Um... Okay, I'm trying to figure out how to display my screen uh, because I've got uh, those, those notes that I sent you actually on a different screen. Just one moment here. There's a share screen button at the bottom of your video. Okay. I could also share them if that would be helpful to you. And we see your email. <laughs> Great. Okay, that was not what I intended. Do now we see PowerPoint coming up. Perfect. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is actually a. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, I'm just very briefly going to go through the Zietzman Lawrence article, um, and I, I, I thought this one would be interesting to discuss because I normally think of, uh, I, I suppose I'm, I'm a little biased in that I, I think of much of institutional theory as very, um, as overly rational and, um, uh, or at least a lot of the, the work that's done today is overly rational and um, uh, and Charlene Zietzma is a, um, and Tom Lawrence both are scholars who have done a great deal of work that uh, is, appeals to someone like me who, uh, who cares about work, you know, related to grand challenges and, uh, and betterment of society, et cetera. And so I thought it would be interesting to look at work that I admire and still, still look to see if there is something in there that makes me question, you know, could, how do we adapt this if, if we are interested in a humanistic perspective that, uh, that, you know, where we are trying to sort of elevate the, the concepts of dignity and well-being. And so um, just very quickly, these are um, uh, sloppy slides. I'm just going to run through. But the the background on this article is that uh, Charlene and Tom had uh, looked at um, the forestry industry in Canada, and uh, in an effort to understand how um, uh, um, essentially how the work happens in field change. Um, so. Uh, both both of these scholars have looked at fields and how fields change across a, a large portion of their work. And in this paper specifically, they're looking at uh, this notion of embedded agency. Um, so the actors within uh, the organizations and how the actors are constrained by the institution, yet at the same time able to influence um, change within those institutions. Uh, so traditionally institutional theory has, has kind of taken that notion of institutional change and said that you know, organizations uh, and, and fields change because of, of forces from the outside rather than the inside. Um, and uh, the real kind of the, the interesting gap here is, or and that the people who do influence change tend to be uh, around the, the periphery of 
uh, they're generally not at the center of these organizations. Um, and so they're, you know, the authors are, are interested in looking at, um, okay, well then, but how do we, how do we see these changes happen? Um, and, and they were looking at the boundaries of organizations and, uh, and the, and practices and how do the boundaries change and, and how do practices change? Um, and, uh, and so what the, the various, uh, literatures that they are drawing on here, uh, have to do with institutional work, um, and, uh, with, uh, kind of the work on boundaries and the work on practices. And so I want to just kind of touch on those real quick. But, oops, did I just skip one? Um, uh, first of all, to go back to what um, Tyson said kind of at the beginning of, of the conversation that, you know, uh, that we're talking about social, you know, social action. And uh, um, social action, and that there, there really is a, uh, you know, we be, if you believe in social action, then uh, you believe in um, uh, the, the possibility that actors and institutions will influence themselves and co-evolve. And, uh, and so that they're really kind of drawing on this structurationist view that as a, as a field evolves, um, we would, you know, we would see them evolve together uh, and influence each other. And indeed, that's, that's what they did. Um, they, as they looked at uh, the, the actors involved um, in, in this conflict between um, uh, forestry, uh, forestry organizations, firms, and all the various stakeholders, environmentalists, First Nations, um, et cetera, uh, they, they found that indeed uh, there was a cycle, kind of four cycles in which uh, the, they saw change happen. And I'm going to, let's see here. Um, Okay, um, here we go, uh, for, well, actually, so the, I'm just gonna flip to this actually right here. This may be easier. Um, so there are four cycles. Can, can all of you see this now? Yep, yep. Okay, great. That's um, what I was thinking of too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it shows <laughs> it really well, doesn't it? <laughs> that's, that's a lot easier. So uh, essentially, the the interactions between um, the the members of the field and the legitimacy of the practice or the the practices that they deem legitimate uh, versus the external perceptions of legitimacy and how the the boundaries of the field and the the practices that are deemed legitimate or illegitimate um, uh, come together and so. Um, First, you will start with a period of instant institutional stability where there is general agreement. Um, and then as more stakeholders are taken into account um, or as, uh, you know, as the boundaries uh, of the field are, are stretched and compromised, then, then you have this conflict over, uh, over the legitimacy of these practices um, and what is desirable, what should be the norm and then, uh, then you move to a third phase of innovation where, um, where you have sort of a reshaping of boundaries, who is in and who is out, um, and, and who has a say in creating new practices uh, that are acceptable for a field. And then uh, finally, just kind of restabilizing that field. So, um, so then, you know, settling into a new a new period of stability about what what is appropriate, um, and where that's so that's kind of the the summary of of their you know, what they found in looking at um, uh, at this this years long conflict, um, uh, but 
I had, I guess I had some questions uh, with regard to this and but I need to open back up my, my PowerPoint here. Um, so uh, this, this article is in many parts the, about the role of agency and, um, and the, they don't necessarily go into great detail on the, the mechanisms by which the individual uh, then influences the, the organization, which then influences the field. Um, you know, Gross 2009 would be a good example for, for someone to look at for, um, if you're looking uh, for a model to build mechanisms to show those multi-level interactions and, and, um, and, and um, outcomes. But uh, what I, what kept coming up for me, and I, I'm really interested in other people's um, uh, comments here, is that I just felt that, you know, we are, we are endowing, you know, if, if we say, first of all, that we're endowing humans with agency, um, then does that make our work, you know, humanistic? Um, because we're denying, because there's a great deal of, of um, uh, older institutional theory that, that really uh, kind of denies a lot of agency to humans. Um, and then at, at kind of at what point uh, is, you know, we all know that there is sort of a balance between the interaction between structure and agency. So at what point are we, are we veering into something that would be anti-humanistic? Um, I guess, uh, and I'm, I'm curious if anyone th thought about sort of the individual agency versus um, uh, giving primacy to the organizational agency um, and, and any thoughts that came up for folks. Yeah, Celeste, I did. I mean, I, I think the focus here is so much on the field as well. So all the organizations negotiating together, the government, the environmental groups, and the companies. And then I, you know, we have this kind of, voila, um, what's the name of the company? McBled, McLeod, something. McLeod, great yeah. name. Um, does something and everything gets better. And it, it really seems like people do those things um but yeah i don't know yeah, the the um the idea that the, the idea that they're trying to draw boundaries around the field is also i think interesting here because are there boundaries around people um do, do those change maybe people make maybe to your point, there's social construction going on and people are making the boundaries themselves. So that is something uh, researchers should pay attention to. Um, but I, I don't know, we'll see what other people have to say. I had those same questions. Okay. Does anyone else have, have thoughts here? Where's the... Was maybe a clarification on Michael's question about Lewin's model of change. Do you see it in the chat? Um, Lewin's model of change. This is just a side observation. It's just uh, when it was presented in this fancy model, <clears throat> it reminded me of this basic freeze, unfreeze, refreeze. If, if I recall correctly, um, they actually reference, let me, I'm trying to look at the paper itself here. They actually do reference Lewin's model of unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. And uh, however, they said that, uh, that they actually found the, the pattern of, of change to be more complex in which, you know, both change and stability were were uh, the norm at different times, um, and whereas I think in Lewin's model, uh, 
change and stability were, let's see. Yeah, so uh, I believe that they, their take is that Lewin's model um, is uh, that, there, that there was not enough um, of a transition in between the, the phases um, or cycles as they, they call it. And so they believe that, that the transitions are more gradual than Lewin um, put it, but uh, it not, not necessarily being a scholar of, of this area, I, I don't know that I necessarily um, have an opinion on which one I would feel would be more appropriate. But they definitely reference Lewin and, and the freeze, unfreeze. It seems like the, the issue of embedded agency, you highlighted it in one of your beginning slides and, and they're showing here, oh look, the conditions give opportunities for people to change their thing. Isn't that worth? Um, but all of this is in the context of, of course, the wider institution theory that says once people's social construction forms an institution, in this case, I think we can say the institution of clear cutting trees being the normal way of, of, of doing logging, then institution theory says normally that is a constraint on individuals' behavior. And so all of this work and, and some of the work that Alex mentioned, the institutional complexity, you know, really cutting edge stuff, I would argue is still trying to carve out these little exceptions to the main theory that says individuals are constrained. I, I, I think that might be the crux for a humanistic management conversation about institution theory. What do, what do others think? And I, actually, we're getting close close to time here. So maybe can, can you restate? The crux. Um, can, Tyson, can you so the crux is that institution theory says that institutions constrain individuals. All the research on change is about finding exceptions to this rule. Mm -hmm. So is that a good theory? Well, so I, I think I might just take one, one uh, to build on that. So institutions constrain individuals, but they're also saying that individuals create the institutions and that recursively we are co-creating each other. Mm. Um, that, that's my understanding of, of the, the process. Um, uh, it's definitely the approach I think that they took kind of in, in that structuration um, where, where the individuals are creating the institution that then constrains the individuals that then change the practices and change the institution. Um, but, but I do think you're right. And I, I, don't, I don't actually know the, the right way to frame this. And Alex, maybe you might be able to to help clarify some thoughts here. If, if we were to say um, the, that the, the crux of the, the question for humanistic management is you know, this issue of embedded agency um, and, and the constraints on individuals, yet the fact that we have agency to reshape institutions, um, what does that mean for us uh, if if we are trying to to uh, write with a humanistic uh, perspective, um, I I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. And Alex, maybe this is where you can kind of throw something in. Is is that issue of the perpetual issue of structure and agency? Um, is that 
the probably the core question that is perpetually being explored in greater and greater minutia. Um, and would that, if, if we are interested in human dignity um, and well-being, uh, where, where, do we, where do we take that? Um, so, I mean, I, the, the first thing I, I, I dropped out there for a second side of call, uh, but I wanted to say that um, traditionally institutional theory very much was focused on structure. In the last decade or so, um, the idea of, of, of extreme constraint has largely been abandoned. And it's not so much that we're looking for exceptions. It's, uh, as an institutional theorist, I'd, I'd like to say that we've wholeheartedly embraced agency. Um, a comment that Celeste made earlier was that institutional theory, regardless of uh, its enthusiasm for agency, is still overly cognitive. Um, and it's not necessarily that a cognitive approach is not humanistic, but it certainly takes an incomplete uh, view on, on humans and the role of humans in institutions to purely treat them as cognitive entities. Um, in the last couple of years, though, the work of Maxim Voronov um, and I think uh, Charlene Zeitzma has also published in this sort of stream, has really attended to uh, the effective uh, aspects of institutions, how we feel institutions uh, and how our emotions engage, interact. And I really do think that uh, if there ever was a time for uh, either humanistic management to draw on institutional theory or for humanistic management to sort of inform as a, as a kind of, not to say moral compass, but as a compass of sorts, institutional theory, that time is now. Um, That's great. So I just, and actually to kind of the, the issue you mentioned, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tyson. Uh, I just was going to say uh, five minutes, you know, let's try to kind of summarize here, Celeste, and yeah. then we can ask people for feedback and talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I, I really didn't want to do too much talking, and so I feel like I've talked too much here. Um, one thing I'm curious about, um, so Michael mentioned that he, uh, he studies social movements, and, um, I, and that's a kind of a different literature with a different take on, on change, a slightly different take on change. Um, I don't know, uh, Michael, if you have uh, any thoughts on the role of the individual um, and is Michael still there? One Michael is here. I'm not sure if you mean me. There's okay. Michael got to move. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. Maybe I can just make a clarifying comment about what humanistic research or how, how we understand it typically. It's that any framework, any theoretical framework can be used with that compass, as I think uh, Alex was mentioning. And, and whether it's a focus on agency or not, it doesn't really matter or make it more or less humanistic. The question is more, is the focus within that study to unable to understand flourishing and the protection of dignity? And if not, then it, it could be either, if the intention is to understand this piece better, it can be classified as humanistic and it can use any kind of theoretical framework. And so, whether or not agency is part of it or not doesn't really matter or make it more or less humanistic. Thanks, Michael. And thank you, Celeste, very much. Um, we have just a couple minutes. We try really hard to end on time. Um, we also try to ask people for feedback about things that they liked or things that uh, they suggest for next time. That's how we got the idea of doing today's session with Celeste uh, proposed uh, asking this question about institutional theory. So I'm just going to open it to the floor for the last minute. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about how we can do a humanistic management reading group even better? 
and what would be helpful to everyone to if in participating. Mm -hmm. and you can certainly email Tyson or me. I have my email in the chat for uh, suggestions for articles or topics. Yeah, anybody working on an area that uh, they could use some uh, group contribution to. Well, let me just say in our final minute, uh, thank you so much to all the participants, but uh, to Tyson and Celeste for leading this discussion. I think we got pretty well into these articles with some good insights from our, uh, from our audience, which I appreciate. Uh, we do meet the second Monday of every month for the PhD reading group, so we are looking for topics and your suggestions. So please, this is for you. This is our community together. So we really need you to tell us what uh, you'd like to discuss so we can be of great service to all of you and build this community even more deeply. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all, take care. Next month. <laughs>